so again, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I know these are tough times. Uh, a lot of uh, time at uh, working from home, and uh, you know, this is we found this is a great opportunity to kind of just reach out and kind of uh, talk. You know, this is a one part of a series of uh, webinars we're going to do. You know, obviously we're going to start with the introductions. So uh, you know, this one is on uh, load pool and you know, brief introduction to noise parameters at the end. So the agenda for today, you know, again, why do we need load pull? We're going to cover some basics of load pull, impedance tuning, different techniques for that. Uh, load pull setups, uh, you know, how people do, you know, load pull, you know, passively, actively, things like that. Uh, we're going to look at fundamental and harmonic tuning, uh, tuners as well. Uh, we're also going to cover some behavior modeling uh, based on load pull data. Uh, tomorrow, there's another webinar we're presenting on that's going to really tackle this, uh, you know, more deeply, a, a deeper dive in, in, in this kind of uh, type of measurements. Uh, as well, we're going to finish with the noise parameter extraction. So, uh, Remy gave a quick intro to myself. Uh, I think we're going to skip this. I think most people have met me or known me a bit. So, I've done, I worked for Focus for, you know, uh, when I started my career, I uh, went to Agilent Keysight for a few years and then came back. I've been back for four and a half years, having a great time uh, working with new partners and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say uh, I'm happy to be back in, in this industry. Load pull is live and well, that, that's for sure. So uh, why do we need load pull? Um, it's, I've, I've kind of sh I'm kind of showing the end result of, of, of load pull. So it's kind of funny that I'm starting an introduction to load pull and showing kind of the end results at one of the first slides. But ultimately, this is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to uh, figure out matching networks on the input and output of an active device, an RF active device, and, and get, you know, a, a, a decent design out of it. Uh, here are two examples. One of them is a very high power amplifier. Uh, with some harmonic traps and some pre-matching on there to, to really get the maximum out of, the, out, of a, out of a device. On the right, you'll see a high frequency mimic, which is the same principle. It's just, you know, instead of having like a, a fixture like we see on the left, we really see a full design mimic that, that, that was designed by someone. And this, this, for example, is an 18 to 26 gig uh, design. But the principle is the same. Ultimately, we want to a perform load pull to, uh, to, to, to obtain or characterize the, uh, the, the device we want to, to, to use and basically uh, put in the best condition to, to get the, the most out of it. Another very popular application for load pull is what we call rugness testing. So there's different names to it, uh, but basically what we're doing here is we're mimicking like an antenna. Uh, a lot of the uh, handset people use these tuners to kind of do constant VSWR testing. So they'll basically set a tuner at a, a certain VSWR and just sweep the phase. So that can mimic, you know, let's say you put your, um, your, your cell phone on the top of your car and, you know, then that basically creates a high reflection to the antenna of your phone, therefore reflecting the power back to the amplifier. So uh, handset people want to make sure that uh, that's not going to damage the amplifier or even blow up the amplifier in that case. So this is a very, um, uh, you know, a widespread uh, test that a lot of people will do, uh, you know, not only at, at, at low frequency, but at high frequencies as well. So the basics of load pull. So before we get into like nonlinear load pull, uh, you know, uh, we have to go back to like S parameters. So S parameters are by far the most accurate and convenient way to characterize a two port network. Uh, I say two port in this example, this is a, a two port network, but uh, this could be to multiple, you know, uh, ports, multiple channels. Uh, you know, we see solutions from key sites and others that have uh, N number of ports. And basically it's just, uh, you know, this is a two port, it's a subset of a multi-port network. But basically this really, uh, the S parameters basically describe uh, very well the electrical behavior of a, of a linear um, a network. Uh, being stimulated by, by electrical fields from the input and the output. So again, if we look at linear behavior, uh, we could look at it in, in two, two ways, frequency and time domain. But basically what this means is when we enter a signal, it'll have a certain period of frequency and, and an amplitude. So let's say this two port network is an attenuator. So we know regardless of what power we put into it, the signal coming out of it will be lower, okay? Uh, so if it's a 3 dB uh, attenuator or if it's a long cable, we know that the input, the signal we input into the, into the device will be basically proportionally smaller. And this delta dB, this delta will remain the same whether the power is low or is high. 
So we could look at it in the frequency and time domain. So again, if we enter a signal, okay, we expect no spectrum growth or no harmonic generation uh, in a passive linear device, okay? So let's uh, enter a signal at a given frequency at a certain amplitude. On the output, I'll have the same, it'll, the signal will be at the same frequency at a lower amplitude, but same period again. As I increase the signal, the, obviously the, the output signal will also increase, but again, it will still be lower than the input. And again, on, you can see in the frequency domain, there's only a pure fundamental signal. There's, there's no harmonic components uh, to this thing, okay? So this does not hold true for nonlinear devices. So as we basically uh, input uh, the same signal into this device, well now we expect, oh, hopefully if we did a good job, we should expect gain out of the device, okay? So now the amplitude of the signal is bigger, the period stays the same, but now the, the delta that we see now is greater than, than what we had in, on the passive device. So now again, if we look at it in the frequency and time domain, how does that translate? So by entering the same fundamental signal, now we see some harmonic content. So if you look at the top right, now we have some spectrum growth and some harmonic generation. So this is mostly showing a harmonic generation, but if you had um, some spurious or you had some noise, you'd also see uh, more uh, frequency content in, 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 uh, in the frequency domain. Uh, also, you could see in the time domain that that sine wave is now squaring up and it's become clipped. So as, as the, the harder you drive this nonlinear device, the more harmonic content you'll get. Therefore, the, 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 the square this uh, sine wave is going to become. So where does this harmonic generation come from? It comes from gain compression. So, uh, you know, let's say you take a device and you, you sweep the input power. So at the beginning, the power will be very linear. You'll have this straight line. But as you drive the device and overdrive the device, then this output power starts saturating. At one point, you, you can't drive the power. You can't get more power out of the device. You'll, you'll hit saturation. And this is where you, you, you know, this line should have stayed straight. But in reality, there's like this delta we're dropping off from the straight line. And this is what we call compression. Uh, we could look at the, the, the gain compression curve. Uh, now, if, if we do the same thing, we sweep the power. So now we see the gain is flat at the beginning, but then starts dropping off. And as it starts dropping off, that's where we, we, we fall into this nonlinear region, okay? Another interesting uh, parameter to look at is efficiency. So, you know, at low power, there is almost no efficiency. So, but as we creep up and start, you know, hitting this, this nonlinear region, we'll get way more efficiency. And that's, that's where it gets interesting for, for PA designers. So on the left, you'll have the linear region, okay? And uh, I'm not saying like for low pull, we work on the right side, but a lot of people do design amplifiers uh, in linear region. And basically what we're trying to do there is match for gain. So, you know, you could look at it as kind of a voltage source uh, and, and you, you have basically an impedance uh, out of the device and you want to uh, basically match that device. So for optimum gain, you want to get the, the complex conjugate of that um, of that impedance. So if, if you're able to do that, then you could uh, you could get the maximum uh, gain out of that device by matching it with the conjugate complex, that complex conjugate. So, but as you get into the nonlinear region, that uh, z load or that termination might not you might not want to optimize it for gain. You might want to optimize it for efficiency, output power, or different different things. And now not just only at the fundamental, but at the harmonics as well. Okay, so definition of load pull, uh, you know, basically it's, it's, it's the process that we use to, to terminate a load with very or multiple or different impedances while uh, measuring or gathering the, uh, the nonlinear behavior. So the or parameters, uh, output power, efficiency, it could be IMD, ACPR, EVM. So what we're doing is we're systematically changing the impedance on the load, gathering that data. So what we're seeing here, there's three Smith charts. You know, the first one at the top of center, I guess, top left, is uh, we're looking at output power contours, okay, uh, but at low power. So the maximum output power for this contour is 15, you know, roughly 16 dBm. And we see the optimum is, you know, in the northwest uh, quadrant. So, you know, someone would say like, okay, well, I'll optimize my, my matching network to meet this impedance, and I should get the maximum output power. 
But on the right side, what we see is as we, we increase the input power, uh, now in this case, the optimum point for power has actually drifted to the southern quadrant, or southern um, basically side of this, uh, this smith chart. And now the output power is, is near 30 dBm. So basically what this is saying is if you had designed your amplifier with the matching network on, based on the first left uh, top Smith chart, well, you would have you know, clearly not, not much power and it would have been a poor design as you know that that optimum impedance for output power has actually drifted down. Uh, now at the bottom, you see that the, 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 the contours are actually skewed a bit. They don't really look like circles anymore. They actually look like kind of potatoes, I guess, or like elongated circles. So what, we, what we're seeing there is actually the effects of the harmonics. So on the top right, we're actually tuning the harmonics as well as the fundamental. At the bottom, we're actually not controlling the harmonics. So as we're tuning the fundamental, we're, actually, we're also sweeping uh, and not keeping control of the harmonic signal. Therefore, it's actually skewing the contours as well. But we'll get into to that a bit more as, as we move along. So again, uh, you know, uh, we had a debate with, uh, with Remy yesterday. We talked about these slides a bit and uh, we had different views about it. But uh, basically what, what we're trying to show here is for each impedance, you know, this for example would be like the optimum uh, impedance for gain. So as we sweep the input power, uh, you could see that you know the, the gain will drop off at one point. So if this in this point, we're showing that this is like the optimum gain. So uh, again, if we want to match for maximum gain, we have to match the the complex conjugate of that of that device to get the optimum gain. Now as we move away from this point, so now you know I've measured another impedance, but moved away, did another power sweep. You see that the gain's actually lower and uh, and it's actually dropping off ahead of time. So now as we move away, we still move away, the gain still drops. Now we're going to go to the other horizontal line, which we're actually getting closer to the, the optimum gain. Okay, but now, so the gain is closer and the output power is still a bit lower. And as we, we keep moving around, we see that the gain is dropping, but the output power, the curve is moving more to the right. So in this case, what this, what this is showing us is, that okay, you, you might have an optimum for gain, but you also might have an optimum for output power, which will not be the same, okay? So we, we continue, and we do this a lot, like compression load pull is, is what we're kind of showing here. So every impedance point we're doing a power sweep is more and more popular. People use it for behavior modeling and, and basically like to do a lot of measurements and then just use a subset of measurements after in post-processing to, to analyze data. It takes, takes less time uh, you know, in the post-process world. So let me do the last sweep. So in this case, what we're seeing is like, okay, clearly if I wanted to optimize for the first impedance, that would have been for the, the optimum gain. But there's a curve here that shows that the power uh, is further and that, that's the one that goes totally to the right. So now if I wanna optimize for output power, uh, clearly the load that I need to present is not the kind of complex, it's something else. So now, you know, that this is the curve I'm looking for. And the curve that I'm looking for is not the first curve, it's actually one of the, the further curves. So now what we could do is we could plot the contours based on these curves and see which one is the optimum for output power, okay? So again, now um, I've just isolated one curve where we're actually seeing now gain and output power. So now we're plotting the contours for output power. And uh, as you see, as you move away from the optimum point, you know, the, the, the contours of the, the, the optimum point will, will move, okay? So what we're plotting now is basically the contours at low power. So if you remember the, one of the first slides where we showed the, the optimum point is at the, is at the top, uh, the northern uh, hemisphere of the Smith chart, you can see that the, the optimum is really at that point. But as we sweep the power, so in other words, as you drive the power, uh, and increase the power into the device. If you do another impedance sweep, you will get a different contours and there will be, the optimal will be somewhere different. So I have a small animation here. There's a kind of a marker, a line on the left that's gonna start sweeping. As it sweeps, you'll see the contours actually drifting. So what we're saying here is for every input power, if we, had, if we did an impedance sweep, the contours will look like this. So as I'm sweeping the input power, you see that the, gaunt, the, the maximum, the optimum P-out P out is actually drifting, going somewhere else. So if I wanted to optimize for optimum output power at this input power, I would need to tune this impedance at, at this region and not northern uh, region I wanted. So now we're just looking at output power. Now if we push this a bit further and we include efficiency. So you know, now 
we, we know that gain might go in direction, PL might go in another direction. So if we add PAE, we're, you know, we, we have no idea. And this is where the nonlinear behavior, be, you know, becomes an issue for us is that this is something S parameters cannot predict. You really need to do this nonlinear measurement and load pull to, to get to, to this point. So again, as we sweep the power, you see that the output power is actually going to the same point. We saw that before, but the efficiency points actually rising. So now I have a bit of a dilemma here. So I have an output power that's going south and an out, you know, efficiency that's going north. I might have exaggerated a bit for the, the purpose of this uh, presentation, but this, this uh, in the end is what, what the result um, will, will be in a high power device, okay? So again, um, on the previous slides, the circles were very you know, concentric, very nice circles. In reality, the circles look more like, uh, like potatoes like this, or, or kind of like ovals, okay? So, so I get this question a lot, like, what is the optimum impedance uh, that I need to match my device. You know, is it, is it a compromise between both? Is it output power? Is it efficiency? And, and my answer, you know, as a, as a load pool provider, it's like, you need to tell me. I'm just going to present you the impedances and give you the results, but you need to end up figuring out what the, uh, you know, what the optimum is. So, you know, as an example, we took like a design requirement, someone that wants to design an amplifier with a minimum of 38 dBm and a maximum efficiency or a minimum efficiency in this case of 50%. So basically on the lower, we see, we see the power. So we see the optimum power is 40 dBm. So now if we go two uh, circles down, so two D dBm's down, two dB down, uh, this covers that circle. So anywhere within this circle, when I present an impedance, I should get a minimum of 38 dBm. So in other words, on that outer circle, that you know, minus two dB circle, I will hit 38 dBm. Anything within that, I will have more than 38 dBm. So now if I overlay the efficiency curve, which is the top curve, and now I want a minimum of 50%. So 50% is basically anywhere within this. If I would have wanted 52%, well, I would have had to have been one curve earlier. But what this is showing is if we overlay these two, well, anywhere between these two efficiency and output curves, I will get a minimum of 38 dBm and a minimum of 50% efficiency, okay? So this is the compromise designers need to do to, 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 to get and meet these requirements. Okay, so impedance tuning. How do we do, you know, how, how do we control these impedances? You know, most people are familiar with passive tuners, active tuners. So we'll, we'll dive a bit deeper into this. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is control the A wave. You know, we're, we're creating these variable loads and we're trying to control the A wave going back to the device. The B wave is generated by the device. So we don't need to worry too much about that one. Uh, you know, we just need to figure out how to measure it and how to control it or how to terminate it in some cases. But in this case, you know, the, what we're gonna kind of go through is how do we do it passively? How do we do it with an active signal and maybe a hybrid of both? So in the end, what's important to understand, we're trying to control this A wave going back to the device, okay? So passive, you know, focus uh, is, is very well known for the passive tuners. We have, you know, anywhere from 10 megahertz to 110 gigahertz and even higher. So again, what we're doing here is I've, I've kind of drawn a central conductor and an RF probe here. So the RF probe is in the tuner and that's what basically disturbs this B wave and sends an A wave back. So let's say we take the tuner that's initialized. So when we say a tuner is initialized, the probe's totally retracted and we send a B wave through the tuner. So the B wave will just go right through the tuner. It will not be uh, affected whatsoever. So this is like sending a, a signal through a cable, a uh, low loss airline. It basically just flows through the, um, uh, the tuner and is, is not reflected back. Okay, so this would be a very good match if you were talking about S parameters, you're looking at a very, uh, you know, low uh, return loss, uh, which is what we're hoping in an initialized tuner. But ultimately, you want to present an impedance and you want to change this A wave. So now by changing the position of this probe, now the B wave travels towards the probe, hits the probe, and a, a certain part of it comes back and a certain part of it goes through the tuner. Ideally, you don't want to, the tuner is not a perfect short because then when you start hitting the line, then you create a, a perfect short and you don't have control over that. And you also do not, you cannot control the, inser, uh, the insertion loss of, of that. Therefore, you can't calculate the loss of the tuner. So we get very close to the line, but never do we actually touch the line. 
So that's how we do it passively. Uh, here's a simulation of how we do it. Again, this is, uh, we're, we're sending um, uh, a B wave through a tuner and we're seeing this, I think is at two gigahertz. And uh, you know, you're seeing the waves going through and the probe is kind of sitting there in the middle, uh, totally retracted, not affecting the, the signal whatsoever. Uh, so there's no uh, A wave coming back. Now, if we do the same, take the same signal, but take the probe and move it you know, close to the line, now we see that, whoops, we have kind of a standing wave going back you know, in and out of the of the poor one, I guess, of the tuner, and but now you you see that there's a smaller signal that actually goes through the tuner. So that's as you know, that's the basic principle of the passive tuner and how we control uh, the the A wave. Uh, now, obviously, when you move horizontally, then you could play around with the phase, but but we'll get to that in a later slide. Okay, the active tuning. So. Again, you know, same principle here, the, the device creates a B wave and for active, now you have to control a bit more what, you, what you're doing with this signal. Uh, so in this case, what we basically do is we take the B wave, we send it through an isolator or, you know, some sort of a, a diplex or something that will split up the signal and terminate that signal. And now with a coherent uh, source, will basically send another signal through, again, an isolator back to the device. Now, the big advantage with this scenario is that we can control the amplitude and we could create uh, as, as, um, as uh, high as, as uh, app, oops. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. back again. Is sound Roland or yep, is it sound okay? You're back, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, lost connection for a while. Yeah, so basically just what I was saying is you, you can um, control the amplitude and go as high as, as you want on the Smith chart and cover the entire Smith chart uh, versus the passive tuner is limited in terms of loss. Uh, you know, the, the A wave can only be as, as big as, uh, as, it, as it can be in terms of, uh, of amplitude and directly proportional to the loss. If you have a long cable or you have something between the reflected probe and to the device, then the, the amplitude of that signal is limited by that. So, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, can't I just go pure active, you know? So why, why would I waste my time with a passive tuner that has some limitations when I could go with an active solution that, you know, can go cover the entire Smith chart? So um, basically one of the, the biggest shortcomings or one of the main shortcomings of the pure active solution is, is the, the feedback amplifier that you need. So the amplifier you need to test a device needs to be significantly higher than what you're actually testing because the tuner's creating a mismatch. The passive tuner's creating a mismatch, taking care of the mismatch for you. In this case, you have to overcome this mismatch. So the amplifiers, the isolators, that's all 50 ohms. Your device is more of a one ohm, two ohms, like 10 ohms or whatever. So there's a mismatch loss there that you need to overcome. So to test a device like that, uh, for example, we have an example here of, let's say you have a device that's a five watt device and you need to match it for a two ohm um, you know, impedance. Well, your, your amplifier needs to be you know, greater than hundred watts. So you know, at two gigahertz, Okay, that's, you know, there's some tons of uh, amplifiers out there, so that's doable. But as you move into like X band and, and like, you know, high, you know, high frequency 5G applications and even higher frequency stuff, it gets more and more difficult and more and more expensive, really, to, to kind of get to, to that point. Okay. So load pull techniques and setup. So, um, okay, there's the, the traditional ones. We've, we've probably seen this over and over again. Again, so we'll, we'll kind of go, go over it pretty quickly, but basically there's a scalar, vector, and kind of hybrids of all these. So the scalar one is really based on, on, on power measurements, uh, on power meter measurements. So you have your device, you have a, you know, usually a passive tuner, you, uh, you wouldn't have a, an active system for this. Uh, and, and basically what you're doing, you're, you're measuring the, uh, the output power and input power by coupling it through a coupler on the input. You can do the same on the output or just through a, an attenuator, but what you're doing is basically cascading the different blocks to de-embed the power at the device plane. And then you have to rely on the calibration of the tuner to be able to de-embed. So as you move the tuner, the tuner will present the different impedance, but also have different loss. So when you measure the, the output power at the power meter, you need to de-embed these, you know, insertion loss of like, let's say attenuators and whatnot. But what's more important is the tuner as the tuner is not only taking care of the impedance, but also changing the, the, uh, the overall loss per impedance. And that's very important to have a very accurate, repeatable calibration as 
you need those those values to de-embed and get the accurate value. Uh, that's why, you know, if you, if you would do this with a manual tuner, that would be very difficult because as you move the manual tuner, you're kind of tuning blindly. Yes, you could say like, oh, you could look at your power meter and say, okay, this is, you know, this seems to be the optimum power point, but your your manual tuner, you don't know what where you are in terms of loss. You might be at a low loss point, therefore it looks like the power meter showing you uh, high power, but in reality, it's 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 not really the best point. You need to tune a bit further, but now the tuner loss will increase, and that will kind of mask a bit the output power of the device and kind of uh, trick you. And this is what this is uh, this curve is kind of showing. So if you just look at the bottom here, there's a power meter curve and a P uh, DUT, so uh, uh, the device power. So uh, if you just look at the power meter curve, you'd say like, okay, well, you know, the the the, the power meter curve is showing me that the right point is the right point. But in reality, if you if you de-embed the loss of the tuner, uh, then that point is totally different. So again, scalar load pool is used less and less. It's it's more for like technology validation and things like that. But uh, you know, it's it's one thing to know that you know you really need to make sure you do a, a, a proper tuner calibration and de-embedding of the different uh, S parameter blocks to be able to to do uh, scalar uh, measurements. Uh, vector load pool, I would say, is, is more uh, you know is very popular now, and it's been for years now. Uh, again, you, you need a vector receiver to do this, and now you can see that the couplers are, are very close to the device. Now we're, we're you know, referring back to the S parameters. We're now measuring the A and B waves coming in and out of the device, and now the tuners are actually outside the, these couplers, and we're, we're you know, the, the, the tuner calibration is not so important at this point because we actually have an online system measuring not only the impedance of the device, but measuring the impedance of the tuners. So, so this vector uh, setup provides more capability. Like some of the key advantages is now we can, you know, measure the A and B waves and measure the P and delivered. In terms of speed, you know, the speed of uh, the, the, the high end DNAs now is much, much faster than, than the traditional scalar power meters. Uh, you have greater dynamic range. And, you know, with the more advanced system, <laughs> You could even look at voltage and current waveforms. Uh, yes, you do need to, to calibrate the phase. There's an extra step to do that. But more and more people are actually looking at uh, voltage and, and current waveforms. And that, that's a topic we're also be, going to be covering uh, tomorrow as well, uh, more in depth. Um, some customers will say, well, okay, yes, that, that's fine. But when I go into this mode here, uh, you know, you can see that the couplers are between the tuner and the device. So that creates additional loss, therefore minimizes the tuning range. So what we do in some cases, we'll put the couplers, when we say outside the tuners, we mean before, not between the tuner and the device. They're basically outside, you know, on the measuring, you know, after and before the tuner, okay? So yes, this will create higher tuning range, but now you, may, you need to make sure that that DNA that you're using has a very high dynamic range because we're gonna measure through those tuners. So if you have very high, high lossy tuners, well, you know, you're going to be measuring through that and that's going to impact the accuracy of the measurement. But ultimately, we'll give you the, the, the best tuning range possible. Okay. So, yeah. So the ultimate range, the ultimate goal here is to, to optimize tuning range at the DUT reference point with this setup. So a lot of people will kind of say, well, okay, well, I want the best of both worlds and we'll go, we'll go hybrid. So the hybrid, basically what we do is we have, uh, you know, two tuners and a source, a synchronized source, and now we have the tuners that are doing some of the passive work, and then we have the active that's also working together. So in phase, the passive tuners and the active signal will work in phase to kind of increase the, the tuning range. So, and also one big advantage of this is this will reduce the, the power requirement on the load, because as you, we, we spoke earlier about the active system, the active needs to do all the work for the mismatch lots. So, so to do that here with the tuner, the tuner will take care, let's say of 70% of the work, and then the active will basically kick in and, and take care of uh, and compensate for the rest. So this is one, I would say, elegant way of doing a hybrid um, uh, way and, and getting the best of both worlds, speed, accuracy, and great tuning range. Okay, let's now uh, just talk a bit more about fundamental and harmonic tuning. Uh, like harmonic tuning is a big thing. Uh, you know, Christos Tsaronis, the, the founder of Focus, is, you know, his, his motto or his vision has always been, you know, load pool is kind of useless if you don't even look at harmonics or, or take care of harmonics. And, uh, you know, this is truer than ever, especially with GAN devices and, and, and designs being, requirements are being tougher and tougher. So, 
this is a quick you know, description of a fundamental tuner. So fundamental tuner is a one single probe on a central conductor. And as I mentioned earlier, as we, we were far away from the line, we basically don't disturb, the, disturb the, 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 the signal. But as we get closer to the line, what happens is we see that the, the, the return loss or the gamma basically increases. Okay, so that's when we move vertically. As we move horizontally, then we basically have, uh, you know, the phase shift. So now uh, the impedance is not only, they, they should stay the same, at the same V as we are the same gamma, but then we, we move horizontally, then that will give you the phase shift that we're looking for so that we could cover the entire Smith chart, okay? So that's a simple explanation of a fundamental tuner. Uh, okay, now let's look at two frequencies. So we were, that was basically the broadband response. Now we're gonna look at two frequencies. So as we move the fundamental, so, the, so the, the, the probe, we see two points. So one point moves in one direction and the other point moves in the other direction. But in reality, those points are connected. That if you do a frequency from one point to the other, that's just, those points are all connected. And we're just looking like, let's say at one gigahertz and two gigahertz in this case. But now what's interesting is as we move horizontally, one point will move twice as fast as the first one. So the two of zero point will move much faster than the first one. So I think the blue is two of zero, yes. So you'll see here as we move along, the F0 will move, but two F0 will move twice as fast, okay? So that's important because when we do load pull at the fundamental, we're presenting in different impedance at the fundamental, but if we don't have any harmonic rejection or whatever, what we're actually doing is we're not just changing the fundamental, we're changing the second harmonic impedance as well. And that will have an effect on, 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 on the, the device performance. So now if you have two probes, how does that work? So same principle, we'll bring the probe down. You have fundamental moving and the second that's moving twice as much. But now what happens if I move my second? So the first one acts kind of as a, as a pre-match. So regardless of what we do behind the first probe, we'll still stay in the same vicinity, the same area of impedance. So as we bring the second one, now you see what's interesting here is we actually you know, moved in the second probe in phase. So at the fundamental, we actually increased the tuning range. But you can see at the second harmonic, it went kind of down, so it went somewhere else. And as we move that one horizontally, that one will also move. So with two probes, you could do a lot of you know, different combinations. You could do high VSWR tuning by putting these two in phase and creating very high reflection. Or you could actually start playing and being fancy and trying to have like two different frequencies uh, tuning and, and cascading these two in different ways. Now we're gonna push it one step further and have three. So uh, one big, big misconception of, of, uh, of, of harmonic tuners or cascading tuners is that the first probe takes care of uh, F0, second to F0, and the third is three F0. But in reality, these are all wideband probes and they all you know, interact with each other. So basically what we do is we, cast, we, we calibrate the probes individually and then there's some advanced math that crunches all these numbers and creates all these scenarios and figures out the different combinations of probe positions to get the impedances that you want. So you might want to tune at 50 ohms, you might want to tune somewhere else. So these are just three examples. So as you move the three probes in this position, well, the, my red point is my fundamental and the two other dots are the harmonics. So now if I'm, I'm trying to optimize my best fundamental match to get very low impedance, but basically the result of this gave this combination of three frequencies. Now I go to a different position of these three tuners, of these three probes, sorry. And then I get a different result. I get you know, a different fundamental match, but then I get an open and a short for the harmonics, okay? So this is interesting because a lot of people want to tune not only the fundamental, but the harmonics for, for uh, you know, to design in different classes of operation and, and really get these high efficiency PAs going. So this is another example. And again, third position, totally different than the probes actually give a different result where my impedance is very high, the fundamental, but now we're terminating the harmonics at 50 ohms, okay? Quick overview, but just kind of a, how, the, how the different tuners work. Historically, you know, people would kind of use this and kind of isolate the signal, you know? That, like they'll have basically a triplexer that filters out the fundamental, uh, lower, single, uh, lower frequency, then they'll have a passband signal, and then you'll have a higher passband filter, and you basically have three different tuners. 
this was something used, I would say, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And I could say I actually use this a few times as well. And one, obviously, one of the big limitations as we talked about this is, you know, you have passive tuners that are going through filters, very low loss filters. So their tuning range is limited. So you could see here on the, on the right that F0 is limited. But again, it's, it's a lower frequency. So the tuning range is still decent. But at 2 F0, the loss is twice as much. So the tuning range will be significantly reduced. Same thing for 3 F0. So this is, yes, in principle works, but how usable is it, especially if you start, you know, going in high frequency. So what people have been using instead is saying, okay, well, what I can do is I'll keep the fundamental with a passive tuner, but then I'll do, uh, you know, um, I'll use uh, active signals to kind of inject and get great tuning range. Uh, you can actually have the three of them that are active and just isolate that. So that also works, um, you know, very well. Uh, but again, the limitation there is, is mostly in terms of cost and then, you know, uh, these, these narrowband isolators and amplifiers are, are kind of like, you know, something that you need to deal with. So if you're always working at the same frequency, same power levels, this is, this is not a problem, but it's just something to, to know about. Okay. Uh, cascading tuners also historically people have been doing that as well uh, again uh, as I mentioned earlier it's not the first tuner does the fundamental second does the 2f0 and the third does 3f0 but it's these are wideband probes and they're used together to basically get these different combinations but in this scenario the third tuner is very far from the so even if you use that tuner to do to to, to help you tune at f0 the tuning range is going to be limited and it's going to give you limited uh, value uh, to, to actually figure out and combine uh, different, uh, you know, propositions to get you the optimum uh, tuning performance. So how do we do this with the MPT? So basically what we've, our philosophy was like, okay, I have a fundamental tuner. I have, you know, I want to just basically, you know, I'm not going to cascade it. I'm going to take that probe, insert it into this, that tuner and just make that tuner bigger and therefore do the same with the three of zero. And now I get the best of both worlds where I have a very simple setup in one tuner. I don't need to combine anything. The, the math inside the, the tuner that takes care of all those calibration and the different probes will basically create the impedances and not compromise tuning range. Okay. And again, so why is harmonic tuning very important? Uh, you know, initially we're showing contours for fundamental uh, data, output power efficiency. Uh, here, this is a 2F0 sweep. So we're sweeping the harmonic impedance. And you can see this is for a class B operation. Again, this is a bit of a preview for tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to dive deeper in this. But basically, what we're showing here is, you know, the uh, class B uh, is, 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 you know, you want to short it with both, uh, both harmonics, want, you need, want to short it. But you, we see here that actually you could find not, an optimum impedance that's not at the shorts and actually get you more uh, efficiency. But what it's also showing you is that if you're not careful of where you actually put that second harmonic, you could be at the you know, north part where that section is kind of blue green uh that that's that would be a you know really a poor decision to to put that uh, that, that that impedance there in your matching network and ultimately what happens is most people don't worry about the second harmonic and then when they do load pull the harmonic falls somewhere and because of the tuner and when they put the design then they, they kind of put it somewhere else and then ultimately the the design and their load pull data doesn't really match so this is to kind of show you that it's you have to be very careful of where you actually set those impedances uh, you see, for in this example, if you would have set it to 50 ohm versus a short, you have a, um, you know, six to seven uh, point difference. But if you set it to a short and open, you'd probably get a two, three, or even a one point difference. So this really shows you how important it is to to, to take care and characterize the harmonic performances uh, of your device. So. A lot of people will say, well, okay, this is nice and dandy. You're saying this, you know, tuner, we're combining everything, but how big do these tuners get? And yes, you know, the, the, the passive tuners, the, the, the low frequency defines the size of the tuner. So you see here, this is a picture provided by one of our partner companies, Recon RF, and, and they, are, they do some advanced serious load pull. And what we see here is it's two harmonic tuners from 0.8 to 18 gigahertz. And uh, this is an on wafer setup. So there's, uh, you know, positioners that, uh, that are basically set near the, 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 the device. And there's actually, you can see on the right, there's a rigid airline. So that's a very low loss rigid airline that's connected to the tuner directly to the device. And, and so that provides low loss, but very stable um, 
connection between it. So there's no phase instability. And so when we calibrate the tuner, uh, we know that, that there won't be any phase difference or phase shift from the calibration to when we're actually tuning, okay? So, uh, you know, we work with uh, other partners. Uh, MPI is basically, you know, you know they, they've, they've also done a great job of implementing it here. So this is the, their version of how to control these low frequency tuners where you have, uh, you know, uh, kind of, uh, there's different flavors of it. This is just one of it, but basically what it, it's kind of showing is you're actually tuning the entire tuner, you're moving the entire tuner uh, on these positioners very accurately. Because uh, some people will say, well, okay, I'm gonna put a cable between the tuner and the probe tip. But what happens in that case is you're actually changing or, you know, slightly, yes, the, the phase or the, the, the position of that cable, but inherently that can, will affect the impedance presented to the device. Again, it could be slightly, but you know, when people have used these kind of solutions where you're actually moving the tuner, the, the calibrations last longer, the performance is, is, is just better, and that rigid airline you know, provides definite uh, uh, benefits. So again, you know, people have want this more and more, but for higher frequencies as well. And the traditional, tuners, you know, would basically just be sitting on a positioner horizontally like this, like the top one, and you have, you need some sort of a cable to connect to the probe and get you to, to, the, to that device. So obviously at uh, two gigahertz, you know, a low loss cable is easy to find and, uh, you know, will, will not affect the, the results too much. But as you go high in frequency, you know, the millimeter wave 5G stuff now working at 28 gigahertz and higher, uh, you know, that just doesn't work because you end up having, you know, your tuning range at the tuner reference plane is very high, but as you put a cable, maybe a coupler, you know, a probe, you will have a significant insertion loss there, and, and that will collapse the, the tuning range uh, significantly. So a few years ago, we came up with what we call our delta tuners, and what basically that is, is we took the guts of the tuner and put it in a miniaturized version of it, so then you could actually connect the tuner directly to the probe tip. So this has a significant advantages in terms of insertion loss, but the tuning range is, is just, you know, you know, great at this point. Uh, we could easily reach, you know, 0.85 gammas at 28 gigahertz, not only fundamental, but harmonics. Here, this is an example is a 24 to 67 gigahertz tuner. So that means we can, can control two frequencies from 24 to 67 gigahertz. And we have all sorts of flavors of this one. Uh, here's an example again of recon where we're actually, you know, this is a 10 to 67 uh, gigahertz system. And, you know, we you see that it's connected directly to the GGB probes here in this case. Um, so, you know, they're doing some very high power uh, measurements here. And, uh, you know, this is what the system looks like. Um, here are just other examples. Um, we have a Dutch customer here on the, on the bottom left, uh, American customer on the right. Again, these are their 10 to 67, extremely popular in the past a few years. Uh, but now, you know, as 5G rolls out, we're getting more and more requests for higher frequency. So, you know, in this case, you know, this is more for X-band and also 5G if you want to cover the fundamental and the second harmonic. But customers want to move more and more to you know, cover even the three harmonics, you know, the, the fundamental second and third. Here's an example again from MPI where you have, uh, you know, 110 gigahertz. So this I think is a 24 to 110. So again, now you could do fundamental high VSWR harmonic tuning from 24 to 110. And now you can see that the, the, the positioners here not only hold the tuners, but actually to uh, hold the, you know, what Keysight calls the M4 heads. So the 120 gigahertz uh, heads. So now you have continuous, um, signal so you can measure s parameters from basically dc to 120 but you could actually perform load pull now uh with the set and you could do like vector receiver load pull up to 120 gigahertz uh so this is extremely powerful when you want to look at stuff like waveform engineering and you want to optimize a device at uh you know 28 gigahertz and you also want to tune the harmonics you know 56 and 84 gigahertz so this is extremely extremely powerful uh you know the beauty of this we have like a, a long working distance uh, microscope here that basically sits uh, you know above the tuner so we have tons of room to move in to, to connect to the device and you know we uh, the chuck is kind of like moves around however we want and it's kind of hovering there so it, it gives us a lot of flexibility and easy access to to be able to probe a device like that uh, this is form factors version of it, where you basically have the uh, uh, the, the, the the M4 heads again 
uh, on, a, on an angle, but basically, uh, you know, similar approach. This is a fully automated version of it. Uh, but yeah, this is just a different flavor of it using, uh, you know, the eView and a cascade, or sorry, a form factor probe station. Again, uh, this could do fundamental harmonic from 24 to 120, scalar and vector, also compatible for noise measurements. Okay. So I am running a bit long here, so I'll try to kind of go quickly. Hopefully we'll have a bit, a bit of time for some questions. So behavior modeling, you know, historically, uh, a lot of people are familiar with X parameters. So we have our version of uh, X parameters, which we called Cardiff model. Uh, it's basically what we do is we do for a set of impedance, we basically do compression low pole. So for every impedance, we sweep the input and output power, we measure gain, efficiency, any parameter that, that is of interest. And we basically encapsulate this, this data in, in an LPC file, which we call a load pole compression file, but then we convert it into an MDIF file that that's can, can be loaded into the different CAD tools. Okay, so basically what we do here, it's, it's not a table-based model in the sense that, you know, it's, a, it's not like a lookup table where we actually look up this, this uh, the, the, the um, you know, the data at a certain point. We basically calculate the coefficients of those different curves, and then the, the, that makes the model very, very light. And we know even if we've measured tons of data, the, may, the model stays relatively uh, efficient and, and light to, to, uh, to, to utilize. So once we've we're able to, to, to import into the different CAD tools, well, then you could do all sorts of simulation for power sweep, uh, power contours, efficiency, uh, you know, second harmonic sweeps, and you can even look at, at uh, waveforms. So again, this is a bit of a um, of an intro for tomorrow, but uh, we'll we'll look at this. But you know, when the goal of like a lot of people with, when they use these uh, Cardiff model like um, behavior models. They want to be able to optimize for different class of operation. So we're familiar with like the traditional classes, A, A, B, B, C, where you kind of control the class of operation via bias. But the more efficient ones or the more you know, neural ones are mostly based on harmonic uh, termination. So we'll look at that really in, in, in more detail tomorrow. Okay. So noise parameter extraction, again, uh, you know, noise is very different now. Instead of looking at the transmitter side, we're looking at the receive side. So, you know, the top curve is like, you know, that's your linear amplifier, which a lot of our customers, you know, dream that that's the ultimate goal. You know, you enter a certain signal and it basically gets amplified with no noise. Uh, but, you know, a transistor and amplifier doesn't care about what's coming in. If is it a signal, is it noise? It'll amplify both. So uh, you'll not only get the gain of the, the signal you're feeding, but also the, the noise that's part of the system and, and feeding through the device. So the real amplifier is at the bottom. You'll send it a signal and then the output signal is going to look like that. So as, as long as the signal is, is big, uh, you know that, that that that's not too much of a problem. But uh, you know, for low noise, uh, you know, amplifiers. If you look at, at a satellite dish, you know, uh, if it starts you know snowing or there's a bit of interference, a bit of interference will will basically destroy that signal. So you know, that's where the, your receiver has a trouble distinguishing uh, the uh, the actual noise of the of the the white noise of the system and the actually the the noise uh, the signal you're actually measuring. So, so that's why these systems are always limited and, and the challenge really is the sensitivity of the system. So, so what is noise figure? You know, it's basically, it's the ratio of the signal to noise that you present at the input. And then it's the ratio of it, of the uh, signal to noise on the output. So you do the 10 log of that and that will give you basically noise figure. That's, that's, very, that's valid and very, very easy to do in 50 ohms. But when you move into the non 50 ohm uh, part, then you need to, to, to take care of, of you know, S parameters of the device because uh, you know, uh, noise figures is mostly defined in, in 50 ohm. If you take a, a, a noise figure analyzer from Keyset, that's a 50 ohm device. If you want to test a component level, a 50 ohm component amplifier, well, you know, that's all 50 ohm and that, that's all relatively easy to, 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 to deal with. But now when you start no talking about noise parameters, then you have to start worrying about uh, S parameters of the device, the impedance that you're presenting at the source and, and other factors. So this is just the, you know, the, the total uh, noise factor uh, that, you know, that, that's a formula associated to it. We're not going to dive too deep into that. But ultimately, this is what we're trying to extract. So the noise parameters are not measured. It's, it's they're extracted based on a bunch of measurements that, that we do. So we're trying to get, you know, uh, the, the, the noise figure of the device. But the noise figure of the device is extracted by finding the, the NF min. 
uh, you'll also extract the uh, the RN and the, basically the optimum impedance, so gamma op. And a gamma op is, is a two component um, uh, value that has basically the amplitude and the phase of the optimum. So again, what are we looking here? We're looking for minimum noise figure, figure uh, equivalent noise uh, resistance, and the optimum noise reflection factor, so gamma op, amplitude, and phase. So for a given impedance, you're gonna get the minimum noise figure. Okay, so at this point we found minimum noise figure and the optimum impedance. Okay, so anywhere else I go, so if I want to match this LNA or this transistor anywhere else on the Smith chart, the noise figure will be bigger than that actual noise figure. Okay, so theory says that to extract noise parameters, I need four points. And based on those points, we can fit those points and extract the noise parameters. Okay, so in reality, we measure way more than that because some points are not necessarily good. We have like, it's, it's a very noisy data, so you'll get jittery data. But basically what we're showing is we'll measure four additional points. And obviously those points are all higher in terms of noise figure. And this will create this noise figure cone or parabolic shape. And we basically fit these, these curves uh, using this, um, this data. And now with, with this, uh, we could also extract RN based on the, on the transition and the, how this variation goes from one point to another, okay? Uh, so what does the setup look like? Uh, basically you have you know, a source tune in this case that's taking care of the impedance presented to the device. And there's two major paths where we actually measure S parameters of the device. And now we have a switching matrix that allows you to switch out the S parameters to the noise path. And now when you, you, you know, you, you basically, you're done measuring the S parameters and the, the, the tuner impedance points. Basically, you now you, you turn on the noise path and that's where you basically start tuning the impedance and measure the noise figure on your noise me figure meter. So here in this case, we're just showing an external noise figure meter, but in most cases we use, for example, PNAX that has the noise figure meter directly into the VNA. So this is my final slide. I want to leave a bit of time for the, some questions here. So this is just a, an example of a measurement we did a long time ago. So this is a 0.5 gigahertz to 67 gigahertz for noise parameters. And uh, this is a subset of uh, two sets of tuners. So I think it's from like maybe pro probably 0.5 to 18 and then from 18 to 67. So this is basically done in, in two sets. And we've, since noise is linear, you can basically just um, um, uh, stitch those two uh, measurements together and extract these parameters uh, for, uh, from, from lower frequency up to high frequency. And this is work we've done a few years ago with the uh, Global Foundries.